So yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, post-prediction inference. Um, but you can follow me if you wanna have a, a, a bigger conversation about this on Twitter as well, at JTLeak. Um, so the, the sort of subtitle is, what do we do after we have machine learned everything? So, you know, there's a lot of excitement around machine learning and prediction. And, and I think that those techniques are amazing and I've seen a lot of development over the last couple of years. Um, and our group in, is another one of those groups that is really excited about machine learning. And one of the things we realized is that we were using these machine learning predictions in a variety of different models after we had made those predictions. And, and so we started to think a little bit about what did that mean and, and how do we handle that? And so that's what this talk is gonna be about. I tend to talk a little bit fast and have a lot of slides. So if you wanna follow along at home, if you go to jcleak.com and look for the talks tab uh, or the talks link, the, the top link at talks should be the slides from today's talk if you wanna follow along. Um, so this paper is actually already out. It just came out uh, this year. It's in um, PNAS, uh, and you got the link there at the bottom of the slide. Um, they made us change the title. It was originally like this beautiful short title of post-prediction inference, and then the editors uh, made us turn it into this long, much more complicated title, which was frustrating, but uh, you, you can find it uh, if you search for post-prediction inference, I think. Um, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about the work of two people, Sarah Wang and uh, Tyler McCormick. Uh, so they're the two collaborators I have for this part of the project and anything good that I'll talk about is almost certainly due to them and anything that's a mistake or, or something silly is almost certainly my fault. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Sarah, who's the real sort of hero of our journey here. She's the one who's been like uh, spearheading this project and has, has come up with a lot of the great ideas. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, but to tell you about her story, I want to go back to a, an earlier version. Look at this bright, uh, happy, you know, bushy-tailed version of me um, from back when I was a student. Uh, I had a similar thing happen to me that happened to Sarah, and so I just wanted to kind of tell that story because I think the analogy sort of helps to illustrate what's going on. So back when I was a student, I observed this problem that kept popping up over and over again. So we would take data, this is really old data, it's from gene expression microarrays, and we would cluster those gene expression microarrays from ostensibly normal tissue samples. So these would be samples that we thought didn't have any disease differences or anything like that. And we kept seeing like really clear cluster, clusters. And it turned out that the, the clusters were because of the date that the samples were processed. So this was a batch effect. And, and so we, I kept discovering this over and over again. At the time, there weren't a lot of techniques for dealing with it, and it wasn't a super well-known problem. But it turns out that that ended up being kind of a big problem. And in fact, it probably, oh, I owe a good fraction of like my sort of career to, to batch effects, which is sort of a terrible thing to owe your career to. Um, but so, so this is sort of a, a table of different data sets, gene expression microarrays, sequencing data sets, methylation uh, measurements. And Sorry, we have, can't see a table here, Jeffrey. There's no table. No table. Uh, I'll skip this. There's a table that you yes. should have seen. That this is, here's one now. Affected by batch effects. Can you see this plot? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is a great example of, of that problem. This was a paper that came out where they looked for differential expression between two ethnic groups. So they took Japanese and Chinese samples um, and they looked for differential expression with European samples taken from the Ceph pedigree. And they found lots of genes differentially expressed with respect to population. But when you plotted when the samples were taken, most of the samples from the sort of Asian samples were taken later than the European samples. And so the differences in differential expression were largely due to batch and not due to the population, which is the sort of biological question that came up. So this kind of problem came up over and over again and caused lots of problems with published data sets. Um, and so the thing that sort of got me my PhD and was the sort of big project that I worked on when I was at the beginning of my career was trying to figure out, imagine that you wanted to find batch effects in data sets where the data sets where the metadata didn't include the batch variable. So this is sort of a cartoon version of a heat map here. And so there are some genes at the top that are differentially expressed with respect to group, and then another subset that are differentially expect, expressed with respect to batch. And there was sort of a, an idea or a trick that we figured out when I was a grad student, which is if you could isolate just the part of the matrix that had the batch effect in it and not the group effect, then you could do things like principal component analysis or the singular value decomposition and get a pretty good estimate of the batch variable, even if it wasn't measured. So this little trick is, is what underlied this sort of singular surrogate variable analysis approach, which was sort of became a popular way of correcting for batch effects. 
So sort of going back to Sarah, she's observed, we're kind of in a similar kind of eerily similar situation with her. So the thing that she observed though is about machine learning. And so the interesting thing about it is, you know, this is all related to the fact that we have more data than we did before. So there's this favorite cartoon I always use in all my, all my talks, which is, I didn't know how to do statistics, but it doesn't matter because I didn't have any data. That's of course changed over time, you know, as the price of sequencing has dropped dramatically, then we get more and more data sets so we can do more and more things with them. So, you know, just a famous formula, if you want to know the sample size of any study, the, the formula that you never tell your funding agency, but secretly is what's going on is the, the sample size is the number of dollars they're willing to give you divided by how much it costs to collect the sample. And the chart for, that I just previously showed you showed the denominator sort of dropping dramatically over time. And so as the denominator of this fraction drops, you get bigger and bigger sample sizes and bigger and bigger data sets, which then leads people to think, oh, we can do machine learning with those data sets. And so this uh, is not surprising, but we sort of see this incredible growth in sequencing over time because the price has been dropping and because it's been easier and easier to collect this type of data. And so what you start to see are headlines like this. Google rolls out AI tool for understanding genomes. I don't know how many of you saw this. Um, uh, sort of tools where you use some kind of machine learning and, and supposedly it sort of solves all of genomics. And then, you know, for those of you that work in the cancer area, watch out because IBM Watson is going to come and solve all of cancer. Uh, obviously, these are a little tongue in cheek for me in the sense that I don't really believe that these AI tools on their own can solve these problems. They're a, a useful tool, but they're not sort of solving the entire problem. And so one approach is to think of it as just, oh, we should shut it down. AI has solved everything. Um, but our experience has been different, that the machine learning helps, but that there's another sort of step that you have to do. So we're not quite ready to shut all of uh, data science research and AI research down yet. So this is the observation that Sarah made. It's sort of equivalent to the problem that I kept running into, which is I kept saw, seeing batch effects popping up everywhere. You know, in every data set I tried to analyze, I would find these batch effects. So Sarah similarly kept running into this problem where you would, this is an example, this is from um, a transcript-wide association study approach, but, but this comes up over and over again. Here in step one, they take genetic, er, genetic data, so SNP measurements of SNPs, um, and then they take measurements of the transcriptome gene expression, and they use, they build a model, so they try to predict with the SNPs, they, they take the SNPs and they try to predict the transcriptome. So they, they make these predictions, and then they have this imputed transcriptome that they get, and then they start to use that imputed transcriptome to do like an EQTL study or something like that. So this is an example of this two-step process where first we make some kind of prediction, we use machine learning to make a prediction, and then we use that prediction to do an analysis. So it turns out that that happens a lot. People make predictions and then they wanna use those predictions in models and in, in analyses. And so this is the problem that Sarah kept observing. It's coming up a lot. So this is an example, again, from sort of transcriptome-wide association studies where you predict gene expression and then model the predicted gene expression in EQTL studies. Um, here's another example where you predict cell type identity in single cell sequencing data. So you take single cell sequencing uh, gene expression, in this case, sequencing data, and you so, sort of- So I, sorry to interrupt, Jeffrey. There's a lot of images that we don't see. That's really frustrating. I don't know why yeah. that's uh, happening. You're not seeing an image here at all? We do, but for the previous, no. The and I, and yeah. I just looked, I can see them on the web slide link from his GitHub. That's right. Really maybe, maybe just expand out your, instead of presenter mode. Yeah. Let's try again. Go ahead. Um, we can see of, it now. Okay. Weird. All right. Um, well, anyway, so this is happening a lot. You sort of basically, if you can't see the sort of uh, pictures, this is going to be a really uh, boring talk. So hopefully uh, they will show back up. But it's, it's, it seems quite random um, because one click it doesn't show up and the next click it does. So it's really interesting. I've never had that happen before. This is the first time that's happening. This yeah, and I, I wouldn't expect it from Google Slides either. So Okay, well, I'll continue and we'll see what yeah, happens. Yeah, sure. Um, so anyway, so with single cell sequencing data, you label cell identity and then you do differential expression analysis, say between those cell identities that you just predicted. Um, another example is polygenic risk scores. People make predictions of risk from genotyping. And so they take your genotype uh, measurements and they make a prediction of your risk for cancer or other complex diseases. 
then they associate those polygenic risk scores with various other scores or fit them in downstream models. Um, and so another example that I'm working on quite a bit now is in electronic health record data, you might take the, you know, the, the notes that doctors have taken or the billing codes and try to create phenotype scores or create phen predict phenotypes and then use those phenotypes in downstream statistical models. So these are all examples where you're making a prediction and then you're using that prediction in a statistical model. Um, the example that our collaborator, Tyler McCormick, the reason why we sort of started this collaboration is he uses verbal autopsy data where they ask people questions about what symptoms they might have had. And then uh, with that collection of symptoms, they try to predict what the result of a real autopsy would have been. And they do this in places with, that are under-resourced where it's difficult to, to perform a full autopsy on people. So they actually just do a verbal autopsy and then predict what those, uh, what those results are. But then you wanna do things like analyze what people died of across countries and now you're back to statistical modeling of a predicted variable. And then the way that we actually originally got into this problem was, uh, and this is related to a Torbug talk I think I gave a couple of years ago where I talked about predicting phenotypes. So I'm gonna recap a little bit of that here today. But we were taking gene public gene expression data. Um, at the time, we had about 70,000 human gene expression samples that we processed. The new version of Recount, this project, is actually just about to be released. And it has um, almost uh, 200,000 human samples, plus another sort of 500,000 mouse samples. So it's sort of a gigantic expansion of that project. And one of the key challenges is labeling the metadata. And so we developed a methodology for sort of predicting that metadata. But now if you want to use it in any downstream statistical models, how do you do that? And so I'm going to give a little example of how this can cause problems because it's a similar sort of thing. We observe a problem happening over and over again, which is that people make predictions of phenotypes or they make predictions of gene expression, and then they want to use that in a downstream statistical model. So what happens when that, when that happens? So here I'm, I'm using sort of the classic generalized linear model framework, but you can kind of ignore all this G stuff and just imagine a really simple linear model where you're relating some phenotype you care about to say the expression for gene K. So like imagine you're building a biomarker, you have a phenotype that's a metastatic status, that's Y, and then you're associating it with each gene's expression. So what happens if instead of using that, you take a prediction of metastatic status as opposed to the actual real value of metastatic status? I just want to confirm, can you see this slide? Because this is kind of a critical piece. Oh, now we cannot see it. Like <laughs> okay. we just see I, uh, it can cause problems. Yeah, would it help if I present from my screen and you tell me when to change slides? I'm going to try one other thing really quick. because I've. Never I think it's a delay. I think it's stop. a delay. There's, you know. Um... Let me try one other thing. I'm going to try one more thing and see if it works better. Do you, if I just share the application, do you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll, hopefully that will be better. Sure. So just going back, here I'm fitting a regression model where the phenotype of interest is observed. So that's where we know the metastatic status. That's the gray Y here. Here I'm using a predicted phenotype. So I, I predict the metastatic status using some other variables, and then I associate it with each gene's expression. So what happens when you do that? I'm gonna show a little simple simulated example. So I'm gonna simulate some gene expression data that's just normally distributed. I'm gonna simulate a, a metastatic status that's associated with that gene expression data. So, the, so there is an association between metastatic status and the, and the gene expression variable. And then I'm gonna fit two regression models. I'm gonna fit one regression model where I use the observed Y, the real true Y value. And then I'm gonna actually make a prediction and use the predicted Y and then fit another regression model. So I have the, the observed Y and the, and the predicted Y. So when I do that, if you plot on the X axis, the X variable, the gene expression level, and you plot on the Y axis, two things, the gray dots being the um, gene expression levels that are actually observed and the blue dots being the predicted gene expression levels, you see that the predicted gene expression levels have much lower variance. They're like closer to the 45 degree line here, or like the, the, the regression line here. And you see actually a bigger spread for the observed data. Well, so the problem is if we now you treat that predicted variable as if it was the observed metastatic status or whatever outcome variable we want, you get all sorts of problems from bias to really small variance. 
So for example, if you estimate the variance of the predicted data, it's much, much smaller. So here I'm showing variance on the x-axis and the gray kind of curve shows the variance estimates you get from the true data. And the blue curve shows the est variance estimates you get from the predicted data and the variance is much smaller. So what does that mean? You'll get really optimistic p-values that are much too small. You'll have all sorts of problems with your bias in your, in your model. And so basically, if you use the predicted data instead of the observed data, you get bad statistical inference. This is sort of, again, being in an analogy to what we observed with batch effects. You could, you could just analyze the data ignoring the batch effects, but you get all sorts of statistical problems. And it's the same thing here. You can analyze the data using the predicted values, but you get all sorts of statistical problems. And so the machines aren't quite ready to take over um, our, our world yet, you know? And so we, we still need to kind of like adapt and be able to work with them and figure out how we can uh, use machine learning while still taking advantage of, of uh, appropriate statistical modeling. So we've been working on this problem of like, how do you get from data to analysis for a while? And one of the things that we come up with is how do we simplify doing questions like this? And this is sort of what motivated us to get to this close prediction inference problem. So imagine you wanna ask a question like what genes are prognostic of colorectal uh, cancer metastasis? Um, so the first thing you could do is you can make the data easier to use. And so this is kind of a recap of, of a talk that I think I've given here before, but just to remind everybody where we were at, imagine you wanna answer that question. What makes primary cancer different than metastatic cancer? You would have to collect patient samples and information. And then here you can really see that I'm a computational biologist and not a wet lab biologist because you would very quickly in two weeks extract all the RNA and DNA and sequence the samples. Obviously those are a bit compressed timeframes. And then you would take a long time doing the analysis because obviously as a computational biologist, I would say that that's where all the, the time is uh, taken. But regardless, you would have a long process to sort of answer this question. And we've been working to try to shorten that by doing these projects like Recount, where we try to do some of these steps for people. And so we originally, for the Recount 2 project, did this for like 70,000 samples. We're now doing it for many, many more, where we do the pre-processing and quantification of the data sort of in advance so that you don't have to do it. Um, and so if you take data sets that are already out there on the internet, you can take basically everything that's publicly available on the sequence read archive, and you can do this processing of the sequencing data and get it cleaned up and ready to use. You can do that sort of in advance so that people don't have to uh, do that individually one by one. So then the problem is we actually have to start thinking about doing some statistical learning to make that data actually usable because so for recount two, we had nine, about 10,000 samples from GTEx, 50,000 samples from SRA, 11,000 samples from TCGA. We have gene counts, exon counts, junction counts, transcript counts, for all of these data sets sort of on a common scale, which is great. But to answer meaningful questions about human biology, you need the phenotypes. And the phenotypes is where you sort of end up with problems. So what ends up happening is these are public data for the SRA. And if you go and look at the phenotype information from the SRA, it is, I would call it far from complete as a generous description of what's going on with the phenotype data. There's there's very little labeling of tissue, you know, sex, race, age, all the variables that you would normally include in an analysis, it's often missing from these data sets. And even when it is labeled, it's a little complicated. So for example, if you look at the sex, la the labeling of the sex variable in the SRA, you can see that sometimes it's labeled as F, sometimes it's labeled as lowercase female, et cetera, for the ones that do have labels. And then there's also a whole variety of other labels that you run into some of which make sense, some of which are a little bit weird. And so you have to sort of like process this data and make it available, the metadata, if you wanna actually be able to do large scale analyses of these gene expression data, accounting for things like sex, age, and so forth. So, well, so you know, this is the usual problem with using other people's data. Anybody who's ever used other people's data will know this intimately that, that like when you're trying to use other people's data, it won't be organized the way you want it to be organized. And so what we did is we wanted to develop a way to predict phenotypes. And so we did that using the GTEx data set and TCGA data set as training data and validation data to sort of develop a machine learning approach to make predictions about the metadata or the phenotypes so that then they could be used when you're doing modeling with these large scale gene expression resources. And so the idea was we split the GTEx data into a training data set, a validation data set, 
And then we used an out of study data set, the TCGA data set, which is also well labeled to test our predictions. And then we went into the SRA and started doing validation. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what happened when we did that. So, you know, when we make these predictions, we've sort of quote unquote solved the problem in the sense that we have these gene expression samples that we've collected that, so this is like the 70,000 samples that we've collected now 300,000 samples or, or sorry, 700,000 samples across multiple organisms. We have those broken down by gene and exon, junction, express region, all of that. So we sort of got it organized at that level. And then we also have phenotype information now that we've predicted. So we predicted that phenotype. Um, some of the predictions are really good. Some of the predictions are less good, but we do have predictions for many of the phenotypes for all of these samples. So now we can start doing analyses where we associate the phenotypes with the gene expression levels to do things like build prognostic, uh, 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 prognostic and predictive signatures to you know, do real sort of molecular sort of analyses of these uh, phenotypes and traits. And so the challenge is that the predictions sometimes make sense and sometimes don't. They're sometimes good, they're sometimes not good. A great example is for our tissue prediction. You know, I'm just showing this example because it has like weird, some weirdness to it. This is one example where the reported tissue might be cervical or vagina, and that makes sense if you're predicting vagina, but then sometimes the reported tissue is lung, even though we're predicting vagina as the tissue. And that's like a really strange prediction. That happens for a number of different tissues. This is one of the ones where we see the most sort of strange behavior. But a lot of our predictions are like good, but not perfect. And so if they were perfect, we would be done. We could just use the, the perfect reported, or sorry, perfect predicted data to do the analysis, but we know that they're not gonna be perfect. So how do we deal with phenotypes where the, the prediction accuracy isn't 100%? So the challenge here is, right, we have kind of a circular problem. We've taken the gene expression data, we predicted the phenotypes, now we're going to do a statistical model where we associate the predicted phenotype data with that same gene expression data. So it's really a little circular, right? We predict phenotypes from gene expression to phenotype, then we take phenotype and we associate it back with gene expression data. And that seems a little like circular, but it turns out people are doing this a lot. So a couple of examples here, one is case control association mapping by proxy. So here what they do is they use genetic ancestry. So for, for diseases that have late onset, things like Alzheimer's, in a large database of people, you might not have that many people that are old enough to have gotten Alzheimer's yet, but you can look at their grandparents and use sort of the sort of heritability of the disease to predict who's going to get uh, Alzheimer's in your data set. So using genetics to predict Alzheimer's status and then associating Alzheimer's status with genetics, so circular again. Same thing in the transcriptome-wide association study where you sort of predict gene expression and then associate gene with genotypes and then associate that gene expression with those genotypes. So it's this sort of circular model. And as you might have expected with this sort of circular model, you get sort of weird statistical results. And so we're trying to figure out how to solve that problem. And so this is where sort of Sarah's work has come in. We need what we call post-prediction inference. So after you predict the phenotype, how do you do statistical inference or statistical modeling correctly? And so that's what our sort of work is focused on and what I'm going to be sort of focusing on for the rest of the talk. So here we have sort of three models and apologies for the math, but I know it's like late in the afternoon to be talking about a lot of math. We have three sort of things we assume are going on. First is there's a model one, which is sort of what we call the state of nature. It means how the data really got generated. So some way, we don't know this usually in practice, we have no idea how the data was generated. Then we have a prediction model where we're actually predicting some phenotype, the Y variable, the phenotype, using any kind of machine learning we, we want to. And then we have the inference model we want to fit, which is where we're actually relating the phenotype to some of the variables in our data set. So these are the three variables. There's how the data was really created. We don't know that. Number one is unknown to us. Number two is the how arbitrarily fancy prediction model we use to make predictions, say deep learning or whatever. And Model three is the inference model we want to do, like is cancer status associated with this particular gene's expression level? So those are the three models. And remember, we're going to take the, the instead of fitting the model where we just know what the phenotype is, we're going to use the predicted phenotype in place of it and do the statistical modeling. So the tricky, the tricky thing is the predicted phenotype could come out of an arbitrarily complicated machine learning model. So figuring out how the statistical model behaves could be really complicated 
because you're using deep learning to make the prediction and working out the math behind how that deep learning prediction will impact the statistical model downstream is a super hard problem. So the trick that Sarah figured out sort of similar to the SVA trick where, you know, when we were doing batch effects, we figured out that you could sort of detect the part of the matrix where the batch effect occurred. And then using just that part of the matrix, you could estimate the batch effects. Sarah figured out a sort of similar trick for this problem. And the idea here is if you get these sort of large complicated models and they're actually available to you, you could try to model it all yourself, but the reality is, you know, Ben and I are on a paper together where we, we talked about this. The parameters aren't always available in a lot of these models. And so you wouldn't even be able to do the statistical correction with them. So what we do instead is, and this is the observation that Sarah made, is that if you just plot the, uh, on the x-axis here, I'm plotting the covariate I care about. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the observed outcome. And then that's in panel A. And then in panel B, if you plot the covariate of interest and the predicted outcome, you see that shrinking variance that I talked about before. So the red dots are closer to the line than the blue dots. So that's, that's the problem that we have. Um, but there's this really interesting phenomenon that if you plot the observed outcomes versus the predicted outcomes, so we're plotting observed Y versus predicted Y, um, you always get these really simple relationships between the observed Y and the predicted Y. Um, in some cases, you can prove that this simple rel relationship happens, like for simple cases, simple models and things like that. But in general, even when the model is extremely complicated, you often get these simple relationships between the observed Y and the predicted Y. And so maybe we can use that to get around having to do all of the math of the machine learning model. So it turns out that this sort of phenomenon doesn't depend too heavily on which model you pick. So if you predict Y with k-nearest neighbors or support vector machines or random forests or neural networks, you always see this kind of simple relationship of the real values and the predicted values have kind of a simple relationship with each other. So we can take advantage of this relationship model, the relationship between the predicted outcome and the observed outcome, and we can use that to sort of fix up statistical inference and make it work correctly. And so there's some math behind this. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically it boils down to approximating this conditional relationship with this simple relationship model, the Y predicted model as it relates to Y. And I can go into this uh, more later. For those of you who are really into math, there's a whole proof in the appendix about what we're doing in terms of our approximation. But the bottom line is we're just basically taking advantage of this simple relationship to fix up the statistical inference. And it turns out that you, there's like a reason why that approximation sort of works. And so now we have four models. I know I'm getting really complicated on you. So we have the data, the way the data were generated, that's model one. We have the prediction that we're making, that's arbitrarily complicated deep learning model, that's model two. Model three is the thing we actually care about, which is, is the cancer status related to gene expression levels? And model four now is our simple relationship that models the relationship between Y and Y predicted. And so using model four, we can correct the inference for model three. So the way that we do this is in, you know, the training set, we fit our prediction. We fit our deep learning model and get a prediction of our phenotype. Then in the testing set, we estimate our simple relationship between the predicted Y and the observed Y. Remember, no matter how complicated our prediction model is, we assume that this model between the predicted and the observed Y is very simple and that it'll be easy for us to figure out that relationship. This is the trick, basically knowing that that relationship always holds is the trick to why you can get away with doing this no matter how complicated your prediction is. And so now we do just like a really simple bootstrapping routine. In any new data set, we take our really complicated fancy machine learning model and we predict our new outcomes. Now we've got our predicted outcomes and our uh, predicted and our observed covariates. And we just simulate data from our really simple model that's our relationship between Y predicted and the real Y. And then fit, instead of fitting a model to the predicted Y, we fit a model to the simulated Y, which should follow the distribution of the observed data if our approximations are correct. And then we can estimate all the parameters and the variance and everything in the usual way. So basically, instead of using just the predicted Y in the outcome, in the model, in the downstream model, we add this step where we simulate from our really simple relationship model. And it turns out if you do this, you add this sort of simple step, 
you can correct those problems that I observed or that I told you about before. So again, we train our prediction model in the training set. We fit the relationship between Y and Y predicted in the testing set. And then we use that to fix inference in any validation sets downstream. So it turns out if you make, if you do this across a, a bunch of simulated data, I'm showing you results from simulated data. Here I'm showing you estimates from regression models. If you like do this on sort of normal data, you don't see much bias. So this is kind of a weird plot because we're trying to throw three scatter plots on one plot here, but the sort of orange color is the sort of the orange, blue, and green all represent the fraction of points that appear at that in that hexagon. And so you can see that all of the orange points sort of lie along the line, but so do our corrected approaches. So, so the bias isn't really the problem here. The problem is in the variance. So if you, in, in this really simple simulated case where the data are all normal and everything is really simple, you get really low, so on the y-axis is the standard error if you use the predicted outcome, and on the x-axis is the standard error for that same estimate if you use the true outcome. And you can see that the no correction approach, the orange dots, um, are a real underestimate of how much variance is. So the p-values will be really small if you just use the predicted variable without correcting. Whereas if you use this kind of bootstrapping-based approach, you can correct the inference to get the standard errors to be about right. They lay right about what you would have gotten if you had used the real data. So you can do the same sort of thing, make the same sort of plot for the statistic, the T statistics. And basically what you see is exactly what I showed you before. So the, the corrected ones are the blue and green ones. And so you can see that the T statistic, whether you use the observed outcome or the predicted outcome and it's corrected, those are about the same. That's why they're on the 45 degree line. Whereas the orange, the uncorrected T statistics, sometimes you get these like enormous T statistics or this, these ultra tiny T statistics, which all mean super tiny P values, even when they shouldn't be. So basically without correction, you get really wrong statistical inference. Once you correct, you can basically recover what you would have gotten if you'd actually observed the real outcome. So this is for the continuous case. These are the three plots I just showed you. The estimates are pretty much unbiased. The standard error is a little bit low. And in the sort of statistic can be wildly off. So you get really incorrect statistical inference. In binary case, if the outcome is binary, like if, if the outcome isn't a continuous variable, things go even worse. So without correction, you can get real bias in the estimates. You can also get real bias in the standard errors. That's so panel A is the estimates, the x-axis is the true outcome, the y-axis is the predicted outcome, orange is no correction, blue and green means you corrected it. And so here you can see these orange dots are right well off the line. So the estimates are wrong. In, in the middle panel, it's the standard errors in the same way, they're way off. And then the t-statistics can also be way off. So you kind of get the wrong statistic, the wrong estimate, the wrong standard error in the binary case, but can be corrected with our sort of bootstrapping based approach. And so similarly, if you look at null cases where there should be no signal whatsoever, the p-values are sort of should be uniformly distributed. And they are, if you use the observed data, that's the gray sort of histogram at the top. If you use e any of our corrections, blue, light blue, dark blue, or dark green, those are all our corrections and the p-values are uniform like you expect. And then if you use the predicted Ys with no correction whatsoever, you get really tiny p-values that are even for cases where there's no statistical significance whatsoever. So very similar to the batch effect case, this is a problem that people are doing this all the time. They're using the predicted variables and they're probably getting really incorrect statistical inference for a lot of their cases. And so with signal, the correction is robust to basically any level of, of sort of correlation between the predicted and observed outcome. What does that mean? Your prediction could be, as long as your prediction is sort of calibrated, it can be highly accurate on the right-hand side and the correction helps, um, or it can be very inaccurate on the left-hand side and the correction sort of still helps improve things. Um, uh, same thing if there's no signal, you get sort of this robust correction regardless of like how good your predictions are. Um, so what happens if you actually introduce new variables, then it gets a little bit more tricky. Like if you go from using a variable in your prediction and then trying to fit a regression model with an entirely new set of variables, that doesn't work very well. And in fact, if you sort of include the covariate in your prediction model, you get um, good, you know, you, you get good statistical inference sort of similar to what you would have gotten um, without uh, correct or with correction. 
if you use a new covariate and you um, don't include it in your prediction model, you kind of don't get the, the right answer. And in fact, things can go quite wrong. So basically, the variable you're doing inference on also has to appear in your prediction model for this approach to work. You can't introduce new variables at the inference stage. It, it won't work if you do it that way. So going back to recount two, if we use these predicted data, how does this, how does this turn out? And so we first looked at one of the most important variables we have in a lot of our data sets. We do a lot of work in uh, with postmortem tissue. So we make a lot of predictions about um, the RNA quality. And so the variable that we care about is RNA quality, which isn't always avail available. So we again make these predictions, um, you know, and we use this approach that Shannon developed to make predictions of RNA quality with this RIN variable. So we have the predicted RIN and the actual RIN, and you see again this sort of simple relationship between the predicted and the observed variables. So if you do this correction, it's a little less dramatic in the real data as it always is. The simulations always make a method look good. Um, again, there's relatively, this is a continuous variable, so we expected relatively little bias. So we did an association between RNA quality and gene expression for a hundred of the most uh, sort of RNA uh, sensitive, sorry, quality sensitive genes. And you can see that the estimates are about the same, whether we use predicted RIN or, or observed RIN. But you can see a little bit in this graph, in the middle in the B graph, that the orange dots are a little bit below the line. So the standard errors are a little bit too small for those associations compared to using the observed RIN values. And that translates into T statistics that are a little bit more off the line. And so you get slightly, especially in the sort of anti-conservative direction, so you get slightly anti-conservative statistical results if you don't do the correction. So it turns out we can work with the machines. This is a robot puppet built with a, a colleague of mine, uh, James Taylor, who actually passed away about a year ago today. And uh, he, he worked a lot on TADS and LADS and things like that. So it reminded me of him from the first talk. Uh, but we can work with the machines. We can actually like do machine learning and then fix up the inference afterwards. And if you want to try this approach out, the software is actually out. It's, it's being reviewed for Bioconductor, but it's uh, available on GitHub. So if you want to install it from GitHub, you can uh, install it here. And with that, I'll just thank you very much for your attention. And uh, hopefully you were able to see one or two of the pictures and it wasn't just me talking to the, to the, to the void and uh, happy to take your questions.